All right, welcome everyone to Chapter 3's lecture video. Chapter 3 will be covering the cellular level of organization. So you can remember in Chapter 2 we talked about um, how atoms will combine to form molecules and how molecules will combine to form macromolecules. And so you can see we're just getting, we're, we're, we're very small, we're getting larger and larger and larger as we go. Um, so so um, as macromolecules get larger and larger and larger, they're going to form a structure known as cellular organelles, which we're going to learn about today. And when organelles come together, those are going to be the substituent parts of the cell. They're going to give us the cell. And so that's our, that's our topic for discussion today. In Chapter 4, we'll cover tissues, and then we'll start covering some of the different organ systems um, and the uh, specific organs within those systems uh, in later chapters. So in this chapter, we're going to introduce the different parts of a cell. There are many different parts of a cell that, that give the cell its unique functions. Um, so each cell is going to have very, very special organelles. And so that's what we're going to cover um, today. And we're going to talk um, uh, especially about the importance of our cell's plasma membrane. The plasma membrane is a very, um, a very, very vital org um, organelle to our cell um, because it keeps all of our cellular contents within the cell. And we're going to be talking about what makes up the cytoplasm of the cell, um, so, so stay tuned for this. Um, we will also be comparing and contrasting mitosis with meiosis, which are two processes um, that are referring to cell division. These are two processes by which our cells are going to replicate themselves, and they can multiply um, through the processes of mitosis and meiosis. We're also going to talk about uh, quite a few transport mechanisms uh, within uh, within Chapter Three. Um, so, so this is just a, a few uh, objectives for us today. So, uh, why don't we get uh, why don't we get on into this? So the human body has a lot of cellular diversity. There are many, many, many different types of cells that can be found within the human body. And here uh, on the left side of the page, we can see just a few. So we can see the sperm cell, or we can see the smooth muscle cell. Um, we have what's known as an epithelial cell, and a red blood cell, and a nerve cell. So there's there's uh, five different types of cells over here on, uh, on this side of the page, um, just to show us um, how different these cells are going to look, and their, uh, how different their functions are going to be. Um, so sperm cells are going to be used for reproduction, while nervous cells are going to be for communication, and red blood cells are going to be used for transport. So three different cells with three different functions, um, and each of our cells um, are going to have some type of different function, um, and that's going to give them uh, a, unique, a, a unique purpose within the body. So cells can be referred to as the basic unit of life. This is the basic structural unit of life. So this is as small as, uh, as something can go before it is considered um, alive. This is as, as small as we can get and still consider something uh, to be alive. And we use those basic life processes that we studied in Chapter 1 um, to determine whether or not these cells are alive or not. So each cell uh, is going to be very, very different. Um, each, each, well, we'll say each type of cell. You know, we might have two smooth muscle cells, and those might be similar, but each type of cell is going to be different from other types of cells. So um, uh, each, um, each different type of cell is going to have unique organelles that give it its unique function. Um, but one of the things that we can uh, that we can note here on this slide is that that all three of these uh, of these structures are going to be. Um, uh, characteristic of all of our human cells. But one thing that's important to note is no matter how different our cells are within the body, most cells are going to contain these three parts. So a plasma cell membrane, a cytoplasm, and a nucleus. So these are going to be the, the major structures that we find in our cells. These are the, the principal parts of our cell. So the plasma cell membrane, uh, this is going to be the, the boundary or the barrier that makes up the the outer line of our cells. Plasma cell membranes will keep our cellular contents within our cells. Cytoplasm is going to pretty much refer to everything inside of the cell except for the nucleus. So all of our, our different uh, organelles that we find in our cell, as well as the fluid that suspends them, that is known as cytosol, are going to be considered uh, cytoplasm. The nucleus is going to contain the genetic material of our cells. This genetic material exists in the form of chromosomes. So there's, there's different nucleic acids that are going to be found within the nucleus. And we're going to use this, uh, this information that, we've done, used in, uh, that we learned in the last two classes um, to, to build on our understanding of the cell. 
So I'll be able to say that most of the cells in our bodies are going to have all three of these characteristics. Smooth muscle cells are going to be very, very structurally and functionally different from all of these other types of cells that we see up here. Um, but one thing that we can see uh, that is uh, that is true for, for all of these cells here is that they're all going to have a plasma membrane. So all of these cells will have a plasma membrane. Now, just uh, one, um, one note here is red blood cells do, uh, do not actually have a nucleus, um, but most cells in the body will have all of these three characteristics. So this is a, a very nice picture of a cell. Um, and what this picture shows us is lots of the different cellular organelles, what they're going to uh, roughly look like, and, and, and where they're going to be laid out within the cell. Now, it's also important for me to note that this particular picture um, is a theoretical picture. There is no exact cell in the body that looks exactly like this one. Um, but what we've done here in this picture is we've taken the organelles that we find in, uh, in different types of cells, and we've kind of all combined them into one so that we can see how they will uh, how they will work. Um, but just keep in mind that certain cells are, are going to have, you know, maybe a little bit more of this of this smooth endoplasmic reticulum right here. This is this is an organelle here, and certain cells might have a little bit more of this uh, than is, is shown here. Certain cells might have a might have a bigger nucleus or a smaller nucleus, or, or you know, and there's going to be a very, very different uh, uh, different characteristics between our cells. Some cells might have more mitochondria than others, and we're gonna go through each of these uh, organelles here, but I just want you to be aware that this particular cell is a template and there's no exact cell in the body that looks exactly like this one. So some of the organelles that we're going to learn today, um, of course, are the nucleus and about the genetic material that uh, that is going to be sitting inside of the nucleus. We're definitely going to learn about the plasma membrane and the cytoplasm. And some of these, uh, these organelles that make up the cytoplasm are the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi complex, we're going to learn about ribosomes, the cytoskeleton and its different constituents, we're going to learn about lysosomes, smooth endoplasmic reticulum, and some more that are, uh, that are shown here as well. So we're going to start with the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane makes up the boundaries of our cells. We have to have a structure that separates the outer contents from the inner contents if we want to be able to, to identify the cell as its own unit. So the plasma membrane will contain all of the cytoplasm of the cell. It's going to be very, very uh, flexible, and it's also going to have a, a lot of different components that can be found here in the, uh, in the cell membrane. So the major component of our cell's membrane are going to be phospholipids. You can see all of these uh, phospholipids here uh, in blue. And I said this in chapter two about how, uh, how phospholipids are going to be the major component of our cell's plasma membrane. So, so keep in mind that the, the phospholipids are going to be the major uh, the major type of molecule that we see in our cell membrane. But there are many other types of molecules that can be found in our cell's membrane as well. And those are what are known as different uh, membrane proteins. So there are lots of different membrane proteins um, and, and glycoproteins and glycolipids and all of these things can be found in our cell's membrane. So each of, these, uh, each of these proteins is going to serve a different function for the cell. Some proteins are going to stretch from the inside of the cell to the outside. Some proteins are just going to be found on the outside. Some might be just found on the inside. And so each of these proteins is going to have their own structure, which gives them their own function as well. Now think back to phospholipids and what I mentioned in, uh, in chapter 2. Phospholipids are what are known as amphipathic, which means that they're going to have a polar part and a nonpolar part. So, so amphipathic molecules have both uh, within the same molecule. They have a nonpolar part and uh, in, a, in, a, in a polar part as well. So the polar heads, these, these heads are going to be polar. And that is important because all of the polar heads are going to want to be attracted to the other polar heads. And the nonpolar tails of our phospholipids are all going to want to be attracted to, to each other, but also to the nonpolar tails of the other layer. So if you can also remember, I called this the phospholipid bilayer when we were in chapter, uh, when we were in chapter two. So the phospholipid bilayer you can actually see here is made up of this inner layer of phospholipids and this outer layer of phospholipids. And we're going to talk a lot more about the plasma membrane and how it functions, but a lot of the characteristics of the plasma membrane come from phospholipids. So I mentioned the different membrane proteins that can be found uh, in our uh, cell's plasma membrane. So there are two major types of membrane proteins. We have integral proteins and we have peripheral proteins. 
The integral proteins can also be called transmembrane proteins, which is how I actually prefer to uh, I actually prefer to refer to them, because transmembrane proteins will tell you that these types of proteins are going to be found spanning the entire membrane. These are going to stretch from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell. Peripheral proteins are only going to be found on one side. So you can see that this here is only found on the inside of the cell. This particular peripheral protein um, is going to be found on one side of our cell's membrane. So peripheral, again, means on the side of something. So, so the peripheral proteins are going to be found on either side. You can see another peripheral protein out here. Now these transmembrane proteins are going to be so vital for our cells, uh, our cells function. Um, so some of these, uh, some of these uh, membrane proteins are going to form channels. You can see that this here is these, these different membrane proteins have come together to form a pore. They form this little, this little channel between the inside of the cell and the outside. So certain things can come in and out of the cell through certain proteins. Some of these proteins are going to be functioning to, to stabilize our cell membrane and, and hold on to these glycoproteins. And so you can see that the glycoproteins are going to be attached here as well. We have steroid components that can be found in our cell membrane that are going to function to stabilize our cell membrane. Um, so there's lots of different things that can be found in our cell's plasma membrane. Um, and, uh, and we're going to learn uh, a little bit more about the functions of these different membrane proteins. So there are six, there are six types of membrane proteins that we're going to, uh, to go over here. Um, and again, each one of these is going to have a unique function. So first and foremost is the ion channel. This is going to be one of the most important types of proteins that we will talk about all semester. And we will be talking about this particular type of membrane protein for the rest of the semester. So ion channels are very, very special because they form some type of channel or pore from the outside of the cell's membrane to the inside of the cell membrane. So this will allow for particular cell transport um, of different ions and molecules to you know, transfer from one side of the cell to the other. Um, so certain times, at, at certain uh, times, we might need to have um, uh, you know, certain sodium ions come into the cell or out of the cell, and these channels are going to facilitate this action. Carrier proteins are actually very similar to the ion channel. They are also going to transport certain substances from the inside to the outside or vice versa. Um, so, so these carrier proteins, while they have a similar function um, as our ion channel, they're going to work in a different way. We call these transporters because these, in, instead of having this channel here and, and certain things that are allowed to just kind of flow through the channel freely, the carrier protein is going to transport one to two to three to three molecules at a time. So the carrier protein, you can see that it's going to be opened up here to the extracellular environment and it's going to be open here to the intracellular environment as, uh, as we go here. So this, this molecule is going to be able to come into the carrier protein, attach, and then this side's going to close off and allow and allow this side to open and the molecule can then uh, can then uh, come in faster. So these do tend to uh, to uh, allow things in and out of the cells a little slower than our ion channels do, but these are going to serve a very similar function. They both will allow certain things to come in and out of the cell. Receptors are going to be another type of membrane protein that our cells uh, cells membrane can house. Receptors are very, very important because they recognize a certain molecule known as a ligand. Now, a ligand, you can see a ligand is written here. All a ligand is, is something that binds to a receptor. So a receptor is going to have a very specific site that only allows certain molecules to come in and bind. And when those molecules bind to a receptor, that can have many different cascades of events within our cell's membrane. These can actually uh, help for identifying particular structures. Um, you can see that in the example listed here, when particular hormones bind to the kidneys, uh, uh, binds to receptors in the kidneys, that's going to change the permeability of our plasma membrane. And so, so there's lots of different effects that can come from receptors as well. Um, but again, this word here, ligand, just means anything that binds to a receptor. So if we have, um, you know, a receptor for the A protein, the A protein is going to be the ligand. As we mentioned in chapter two, we also have enzymes. Enzymes are another type of uh, membrane protein that we will find in our cell's membrane. So enzymes are going to be functioning to catalyze different chemical reactions and speed up the overall speed of our chemical reactions. And we can remember from the last, uh, from the last chapter two how these enzymes work. There's going to be a substrate that binds to a particular active site. Um, all enzymes are going to end in this abbreviation, or um, ASE. So any, any ASE we see is going to be um, referring to some type of enzyme. 
So I'll just uh, say, for example, since we since we did this one in chapter two, sucrase is an enzyme that's going to break down sucrose. So particular enzymes for, for certain substrates can be found in our cell's membrane as well. We have linker proteins. These can be both uh, both integral and peripheral. Um, so, so these can be uh, either spanning the, uh, the, the, the cell's membrane, or these can be only on one side. So our linker proteins are going to function to anchor different proteins to each other um, and create a strong structure. Um, so certain linker proteins can link two different, uh, two different proteins together. Certain linker proteins can link two different cells together. So the linker proteins will actually help um, to, to bring two different structures together and hold them fast um, and give some stability to our cell. Lastly, here are the cell identity markers. These are actually glycoproteins. So glycoproteins are going to be um, some type of carbohydrate in a protein. Think back to glycogen. Glycogen is a long, it's, that's, our, that's our, our primary storage form of carbohydrate in the body. It's just a long chain of glucose molecules. So we have, we might have some uh, glycoprotein. You know, this might not be uh, glucose per se, but with a glycoprotein, that's going to be some, some chain of carbohydrates on a protein. And so these cell identity markers, of course, will help to uh, identify our cells. It will help other cells identify our cells. This can also um, allow our cells to identify potentially dangerous cells. So, so our cell identity markers or our glycoproteins are going to be very important as well. When individuals are undergoing some type of transplant, and we have to actually be very careful with these cell identity markers. Oftentimes, we have to get this, this MHC protein, that's a, uh, a, a special um, cell identity marker, we have to get this MHC protein to match up within our donor. And this is why it can be very difficult to find donors whenever you are needing a transplant. And the reason that this is important is because if you don't link up the right MHC uh, to, uh, to, you know, uh, to our, our, our patient, our patient starts to recognize the transplanted organ as a foreign entity, and it starts to attack that organ. And so it, our bodies can reject organs if we don't get, uh, if we don't get our MHC proteins right. But these can also, uh, you know, aside from being a, a nuisance uh, when, when doing transplants, these can actually be very, very helpful for identifying different uh, harmful, uh, harmful pathogens as well. So these are six different types of proteins. Each of them is going to fulfill a different function for our, 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 our cell. I mean, they're all going to be found in our cell's membrane. Some of them are going to be transmembrane or integral proteins, and some of them will be peripheral or just found on the outside. Membrane fluidity refers to a concept about our cell's membrane that's going to mean that our cell's membrane can, is, is very, very flexible. And the particular constituents of our cell membrane can actually freely move around within our cell's membrane. That's what membrane fluidity, uh, fluidity refers to. So if we think back to our uh, to our uh, the picture of the cell membrane, we remember we had a lot of phospholipids and a bunch of transmembrane and peripheral proteins that can be found within our cell's membrane, making up our cell's membrane. So the phospholipids in, the, in those, those different membrane proteins can actually move around through our cell's membrane. That's what membrane fluidity refers to, is the ability for, for the cell's membrane to, to adapt and, and move around and, 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 and different constituents of our cell's membrane to, to move to particular sides of the cell. So our phospholipids, for example, they're able to move around. So we go back to this picture, you might see this phospholipid. You know, at, at one moment it might be over here, but, you know, after a few seconds, maybe it traveled over here. And, and then maybe this protein, you know, maybe we have, you know, um, let, let's say we have a... Um, an ion over here that wants to go through this uh, this particular channel. Maybe this protein can move around over here, and it can come take that ion in. So, so membrane, the, the, our, our plasma membrane is very fluid, which means that that these phospholipids and in, in, in different channel proteins and, and such can move around nicely through our cell's membrane. Now, there is one rule about membrane fluidity, and that uh, that rule states that outside our, our extracellular phospholipids cannot switch places with our intracellular phospholipids. So these are, these are the extracellular phospholipids because they're found uh, uh, touching the extracellular fluid. And phospholipids can actually transport you know, themselves around the cell in, uh, in seconds. They can move very, very quickly throughout our cell's membrane. But what they cannot ever do is, is we, we, we cannot take our extracellular phospholipids and they cannot switch sides. So we cannot have... Um,
a swapping from, from extracellular to intracellular or vice versa. They have to remain in their own layer of the phospholipid bilayer. So that's important to note this, uh, this little, uh, little piece of information. These phospholipids and the proteins, they are mobile, but they must stay within their own half of the phospholipid bilayer. So particular peripheral proteins, they will have to stay in their, um, their layer of the phospho, uh, phospholipid bilayer as well. The transmembrane proteins, they're going to be able to move around freely. Cholesterol is going to be another, uh, another um, uh, constituent that we see in our cell's membrane. And this will actually be reducing membrane fluidity. So membrane fluidity is a great thing. It gives our cells the ability to get squeezed and, 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 and moved around, and, and it gives our cell the ability to adapt to lots of different changes. Um, however, we don't want our cell's membrane to be too fluid. Uh, otherwise, we won't have any nice shape to our cell. So cholesterol is going to be an important, uh, an important component that we will also find in our cell's membrane that actually reduces membrane fluidity. So it's going to actually stable the membrane, uh, stabilize the membrane, and reduce our, uh, our membrane fluidity. A very cool example of how membrane fluidity is going to work is there are particular uh, particular needles that are very very small and we can stick them into our cell and, and inject certain things into cells for for many different purposes. Um, but that being said, whenever we remove that uh, that needle from uh, from our cell, and instead of popping the cell, the cell's bilayer is actually going to fuse and, and form again. It's going to to seal up that hole all on its own. So membrane fluidity is a very very important uh, characteristic of our cell's membrane. Now, one of the other things that we see uh, on the outside of our cell membrane, these are going to be specifically found on the outside of our cell membrane, is what is known as a glycocalyx. So a glycocalyx refers to, to something that is sugar-coated, sugar-coated, and sugars are different types of carbohydrates, so we're, so we're sort of coming full circle here. So our glyco is going to tell us that we're looking at different types of, of carbohydrates that are sticking off the outside of our cells. So you can see the glycolipids here, these are different carbohydrate chains. And these carbohydrate chains, they're called glycolipids because they're just a carbohydrate attached to a lipid, and the lipid is the phospholipid. So glycolipids, you can see here, are, are, are bound to our cell's membrane, while glycoproteins are going to be um, having just carbohydrates that are going to be attached to the different, uh, you know, different proteins that are found within our cell's membrane. So there's a lot of function to a cell's glycocalyx. First and foremost, they are sticky. They will help cells stick to each other. They will help cells attach to each other um, and hold on. Glycocalyces, as we'll say uh, using the plural, uh, the plural of glycocalyces, glycocalyces allow two cells to stick together nicely. Um, one of the most, uh, one of I, I guess I'll say the most interesting in, in my opinion. I think uh, I think this next one here is a uh, very opinion. Is this this gives our cells um, a, its own signature? Uh, this is used for cell identification. Um, so so remember I said earlier about how certain bacteria are going to be you know floating around our bodies, um, and our immune cells are going to grab them up. They're going to take them up by these glycocalyces. Um, the glycocalyx is going to to have particular. Um, structures that help our cells to identify other things. So one example here is this is how our sperm cell is going to identify the egg cell. The sperm cell is going to look for the proper glycocalyx that's sticking off the side of our egg cell. Um, this is how immune cells are going to identify bacteria and so forth. So there are, there are you know, over time, our, our immune cells have, have evolved to get really, really good at identifying certain bacteria. And there are certain glycocalyces that are unique to more than one type of bacteria. And our bodies have learned that if we find that glycocalyx uh, somewhere in the body, we're going to just, we're going to take that in and we're going to digest that cell. Um, so the, the uh, glycocalyx does serve a cellular uh, identification uh, function as well. Now, as I mentioned, there are two types of these. The glycoproteins and the glycolipids are both considered part of the glycocalyx. So the glycocalyx is sort of the overall arrangement of, of what our cell's identification is going to look like. Now, while these can be very beneficial for our immune cells and for, uh, for sperm and egg cells, these can also, um, you know, our, we were not the only um, organisms that were evolving. Our, our bacterial cells are actually always evolving as well, and they evolve a lot faster than we do. Um, and so there are certain types of, of cells that can actually change their, uh, their glycocalyx, and this allows them to escape the immune system. So if they can, uh, if they can remove that glycocalyx that we use, our body cells use to take them in, if they can remove that, well, well, they can they can evade our immune system um, and not uh, not per, uh, perhaps um, get eaten like uh, like like former uh, like former bacteria. 
One example of a cell that uh, that does this is uh, actually Neisseria gonorrhea. Uh, gonorrhea is a very, it's, it's actually just been classified as a superbug. This is not a, uh, a condition that you want to get. So Neisseria gonorrhea, that's the, the, the bacteria's name, um, it's, uh, it's constantly changing its, its, it, the, you know, what are called the antigens or the glycocalyx on the outside of our cell's membrane. And this makes it very, very difficult for our medications and immune systems to keep up with, uh, with Neisseria gonorrhea. Um, so this is just one example of how cells can actually change their glycocalyx um, in order to evade the immune system. So, so the glycocalyx gives us a, a cell signature and it also helps for different cells to stick to each other. As we talk about our cell's membrane, we're going to get into the concept of membrane permeability. So what membrane permeability states is that certain things can go through our cell's membrane and certain things can't. This is such an important concept uh, to, for, us to, for us to understand. Certain things can come into the cell, certain things can't come into the cell. Certain things can leave the cell and certain things can't. So um, the lipid bilayer is permeable to different small molecules. Small molecules are going to be uh, uh, are, are going to be able to cross the cell membrane freely. Uncharged polar molecules or uncharged polar molecules are going to be able to cross, and our nonpolar molecules are going to to have a much easier time crossing. These are going to be um, the essentially we'll say that the lipid bilayer is permeable to these types of molecules. I definitely want you to know this as it's highlighted in red. Now, one of the other important things to note about membrane permeability is while certain things can cross the cell membrane, certain things cannot cross the membrane. But just because something can't cross the membrane on its own, that doesn't mean that we, you know, we won't need to cross that, that molecule from, from, you know, from the outside to the inside um, at any time. And this is where our channel proteins are going to come in. So our channels and our transporters, uh, those are both going to function to increase our cells' permeability. So for example, ions, particular ions, might need to get from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell, and they cannot cross the cell membrane on their own. They're going to have to have some type of, of molecule that's facilitating their transport into the cell. So our transmembrane uh, channels, as well as our carriers, are going to be helping transport ions and polar molecules across our, across our cell membrane. So some of these, like I said, can, can, can pass through all on their own. These, these small molecules are really nice because they can just kind of sort of squeeze right through and they, they don't really interact with anything here and they just kind of, they kind of make their way across. And they can freely diffuse across, um, and, you know, sort of without our cell's permission. But the ions, for example, they are going to have charges. Remember, ions are any, uh, any type of molecule that has lost or gained an electron. So that means it's going to have a charge. And if we have a charge, that's going to, to allow our, our ions, or I should say that should, that's going to prevent our ions um, from interacting with our cell's membrane. We're also going to need a way to transport larger molecules into our cell, and this is going to be done by transport as well. So macromolecules such as glucose, one of our one of our most common sugars, especially in uh, in this class, we're going to talk a lot about glucose in chapter 25. Um, so so glucose is going to be one uh, one molecule that that can only cross from from the inside of the outside of the cell um, through different types of membrane transport. We we don't have you know glucose is too big to squeeze its way through the membrane. That's just just not going to work. So this is another picture uh, that you can see here of a, of a different, um, you know, a, a, a transmembrane protein here with a, with a channel in the center. You can see our cell's glycocalyx out here. And you can see the phospholipids, which are the major component of our cell membrane. You can see these two different layers. Remember, these, these phospholipids can freely move around one another, and they can, they can move from one side of the cell to the other, and, and they can do this very, very quickly. Um, but what they cannot do is become, uh, these, these intracellular uh, phospholipids cannot become extracellular phospholipids. So, so keep that in mind when we're talking about membrane fluidity as well as membrane permeability. Now, before we get uh, into breaking down the different types of transport across our cell's membrane, it's important for us to understand what a gradient is. So there are a few different types of gradients that we're going to talk about. We have the concentration gradient, we have the electrical gradient, and we have the electrochemical gradient. So let's, let's, break, uh, let's break these down here. Now, what we're going to be doing for the rest of this presentation is the concentration gradient. This is going to be the focus of the rest of chapter 3. And the electrical gradient we'll start talking about uh, when it comes to chapter 10 um, and chapter 12. So a concentration gradient refers to a difference in our concentration between one side of the cell's membrane and the other side of the cell membrane. 
So let's say, for example, we have a bunch of sodium ions. If we have a bunch of sodium ions on the outside of our membrane, and we have no sodium ions in the inside of our membrane, the gradient is going, that's going to be a difference. There's a difference between sodium from the inside to the outside of the cell. So concentration just refers to how many there are of something. If there's more of, of if there's more sodium ions in one spot and less sodium ions uh, in another spot, that's going to set up a gradient. And gradients are important to understand the concept of diffusion, which just refers to the movement of, of particles through a substance. So, so a concentration gradient is important for us to understand. It's important you guys, that you guys are understanding a, a concentration gradient um, and how these are going to be set up. So concentration gradients will always point from a high concentration to a low concentration. So I took a second here to draw a few uh, a few dots uh, a few dots for you guys. Um, so what we can see over here is that there's a lot of dots, and over here uh, there are fewer dots. So the concentration in this area is a lot higher. This area is much uh, much more highly concentrated than this area. Now, if we were to look at this in a solution, concentration gra gradients always point from a high concentration to a low concentration. So what we will always see is our concentration gradient will point uh, in this direction. Concentration gradients, again, are going to refer to the diffusion of substance through a particular solution. So what that means is that these particles over time are going to want to spread out and they're going to want to spread out in this direction because our highly concentrated area, you know, at the, at the, at the chemical level here, these particles are going to be bumping against one another and they're going to want to, to diffuse outwards. And so these particles are going to move over, uh, over in this direction and that's going to eventually give us a more, uh, a more equal concentration throughout our entire, uh, our entire solution. So I will talk a lot more about concentration gradients uh, in the next uh, couple slides, but I just want to take a quick moment to understand the electrical gradient. So an electrical gradient refers to a charge difference for between the inside and the outside. So if our inside of our cell has a negative 50 charges and the outside of our cell has positive 100 charges, that's going to be a, a major difference of charges. But again, I will discuss this um, quite a bit more uh, in chapter 10 and 12. The electrochemical gradient is just the combination between the concentration and the electrical gradient. Um, so the concentration is also known as the chemical gradient because that just refers to individual uh, chemicals and their individual concentrations. So the electrochemical gradient um, refers to these two, these two gradients combined. So the next part of this presentation, we'll talk about transport across the membrane. There are many, many ways that our cells can get things from one side of the cell to the other. And we will characterize these into two different groups. So we have passive processes and we have active processes. Passive processes are going to, to happen without energy. Passive processes occur without energy on their own. This is going to be the diffusion down a concentration gradient. So all of our passive processes are going to move from a high concentration to a low concentration. Active processes are going to require energy. They require energy in the form of ATP. ATP is our body's energy currency. You guys remember when I went over ATP in, in, at the end of Chapter 2's lecture video. So ATP is going to be our body's form of energy. And these active processes will require ATP in order to carry them out. And so that's the main difference. Passive processes do not require energy, while active processes do require energy in the form of ATP. So the passive processes that we're going to discuss tonight um, are simple diffusion. We're going to go over simple diffusion. We're going to talk about facilitated diffusion, and there are two types of facilitated diffusion. We have channel-mediated facilitated diffusion, and we have carrier-mediated facilitated diffusion. And then we're going to discuss the concept of osmosis. All of these are passive processes that do not require energy. Some of the active processes that we're going to discuss are primary transport, which is often called active transport, and vesicular transport, which is transport using a particular cellular organ organelle known as a vesicle. So we're going to break each of these down, uh, each of these down as we go. First and foremost is simple diffusion. Simple diffusion. I, I like simple diffusion because I like to say si things simply will diffuse throughout a, a, a solution. 
So um, you can see that on the left here, we have three graduated cylinders, and they have some blue substance here at the bottom uh, in this one, and then this one has a little bit more blue in it, and then this one has a lot of blue in it. Um, and so this is not showing us three different graduated cylinders. This is showing us the same graduated cylinder over time. So we might be able to say that, that this, is at, uh, this is at zero seconds. At zero seconds is going uh, to be this one. We might say that this one is at one minute. We'll say that this one's at one minute. And then we'll say that the third one over here is going to be at, uh, let's, say, let's say, two minutes. So over the course of time, uh, particular molecules are going to diffuse through a solution. So at zero seconds, our solution is going to look like this. And after one minute, we take a snapshot. And that's what we see here. So what simple diffusion is, is when we have a highly concentrated area within a solution, and then it's going to diffuse outward and spread out throughout the solution. That's what simple diffusion is, is the spreading out of molecules to equilibrate, um, or we'll say make equal, um, all of the concentrated areas of our solution. So you can see that we've we've dropped some blue dye here in the bottom of this graduated cylinder, and after a minute, it, the, you know, they're going to start spreading out up here. And after two minutes, you can see that, uh, that this has sort of been uh, equilibrated. There's a lot of uh, essentially the, the entire entire graduated cylinder is containing the most amount of particles. So at this at this part, uh, if we look at this solution down here, if we were to look at this position right here compared to up here, this spot is going to be highly concentrated with blue dye particles. There's a lot, there's a high concentration of blue dye particles, and here there's a very, very low concentration of blue dye particles. So because all gradients point from high to low, this area of highly concentrated blue dye uh, particles is going to spread out. These blue dye particles are going to move this way. So this concentration gradient is also going to point from a high concentration to a low concentration. And the same thing is still is still here. Now we can see comparatively um, in, this, in this picture, this area is now going to be less concentrated because all of these dye particles have now diffused outwards and they're going to be moving up here. So this is less concentrated than this picture was, but this area is still more highly concentrated than up here. So this gradient is still going to be pointing, uh, be pointing to an area of low concentration. Now over here, things are going to be fairly the same. Um, you know, we may we may have some minute differences here, but in this picture, we can see that both of these uh, both of these sides here, these are going to be fairly the same. So there's really not going to be much of a gradient at this point. Uh, at this point, once our our diffusion has fully occurred. So lots of different things can affect uh, the rate of diffusion. It says diffusion is influenced. We should say diffusion rate is influenced. Certain things are going to diffuse faster than others. And so some of the things that affect this rate of diffusion are the steepness of the concentration gradient. Are there 10 particles here or are there 100 particles here? How steep is that difference? Um, you know, When I say a difference in concentrations, I'm talking about a mathematical difference. How many particles are over here compared to how many particles are over there? So how the, 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 the difference between the area of high concentration and the area of low concentration is going to be what the steepness of our concentration gradient is referring to. Temperature is another example. Um, the hotter, uh, the hotter our solution is, the faster the fusion is going to occur. So that's been uh, that's kind of the trend that I always uh, tend to stick to in my science classes. Um, is uh, the hotter something is, the faster it's going to be moving. So if we were to if we were to put this um, if we were to put this uh, you know this uh, liquid um, on uh, on a stove and we were to heat it up and we were to apply heat, this is probably going to diffuse a lot faster than it was. Maybe maybe this picture would look like this uh, in 30 seconds if we put uh, if we put the, this over uh, over the stove or something like that. The mass of the substance being diffused is going to uh, is going to uh, play a role here. The larger our substance, the slower it will diffuse. So the smaller the substance, the faster it will diffuse. And if we look at again at the chemical level, we just have a bunch of molecules that are sitting in here. And so larger particles have to move through more particles. They have to push more particles out of the way in order to diffuse further. So our small molecules are nice because they can just sort of squeeze and, and move quickly. I like to, to compare this here to, uh, to driving on the interstate. Um, if you are driving uh, a, a semi-truck on the interstate, um, there's a lot of other other cars that you have to be cautious of, and you're not going to be able to drive as quickly. Um, however, if you're driving in a much smaller car like a Corvette, you're going to be able to squeeze in and out of smaller spaces, and that's going to help you to diffuse a lot faster. 
Surface area is, uh, is, a, is another component that's going to, to play a role here. So what surface area refers to um, is essentially the, the amount of space given for us to diffuse. So the surface area is actually referring to the area of the opening of this graduated cylinder. Um, so, so while we have a graduated cylinder that might be uh, might be fairly uh, might be fairly skinny here, the surface area is going to be uh, is going to be the area by which these things can uh, can 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 diffuse through. If we were to have a really thick beaker, uh, for example, and we had a lot of particles that were found at the bottom of our beaker, we had a, had a lot of particles down here. If we have a lot of particles found here at the bottom of our beaker, these are going to be able to move uh, more move more readily through the solution because there's more of a space for them to move through. Um, you know, if because the graduated cylinder is so skinny, um, and there's a, there's not a lot of space for our for our um, blue dye particles to diffuse through, this is going to be a little slower than if we were looking at a beaker here. So there's only the space between here and the space between here. So this space is only is what's going to be allowing a surface area of diffusion. So the more surface area we have, the more readily uh, diffused our particles can be. And lastly, of course, is the distance. The diffusion distance is going to be a major player here as well. So how far does our, does our, our, our particles need to go? How far do our particles need to go? Um, this of, over here, you can see that, that uh, this distance is shorter. Then up here, you know, as you can see that this is going to be a shorter distance. So these blue dye particles got here first because the distance was shorter here compared to here. So the further we are, our particles need to go, um, the longer it will take for our particles to diffuse there. So these are different uh, uh, influencing factors that will affect how quickly simple diffusion will occur. Now, don't forget simple diffusion. Simple diffusion is our first type of passive transport. It does not require energy, and it goes from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. But the rest of these types of diffusion that we're going to talk about will actually um, include simple diffusion uh, in some way. Simple diffusion is going to be a player in each of these other types. So our next type is going to be facilitated diffusion. And there are two types of facilitated diffusion channel-mediated facilitated diffusion, and carrier-mediated facilitated diffusion. And while these are big words, the only difference here is that channel-mediated facilitated diffusion will use a membrane channel, while carrier-mediated facilitated diffusion will use some type of membrane carrier protein. So the only difference between these two types is whether or not we have a channel protein or a carrier protein. So these, these must be transmembrane proteins. These must reach from one side of the cell to another in order, for, for to, you know, in order to get substituents from one side of the cell to the other. So these, um, these, different, uh, these different channels are going to help things that cannot cross the membrane on their own make it from the inside to the outside. So simple diffusion is, uh, is actually a phenomenon that can occur. Those small molecules I, I, I talked about can actually diffuse through our cell's membrane um, readily. They can, they can freely move through our cell's membrane. They act as if the cell membrane is not even there. They can just go through. However, certain molecules cannot do that. They are, they are not able to cross the membrane on their own. And that's why we will need to facilitate their diffusion with some type of, of protein, some type of membrane protein. So you can see that a concentration gradient is showing us that this is the high area, uh, the high area of concentration, and this is going to be our area of low concentration. So you can see there's more particles up here than there are here. And each of these particles is going to have their own concentration gradient. We have, our, we have the purple concentration gradient, we'll have the gray concentration gradient, and we'll have the, the yellow-orange um, concentration gradient. Each of these, each of these par uh, particles are going to have their own concentration gradient. Um, however, we can see that all of these concentration gradients are going to be pointing from up top here to, to down here. So simple diffusion, these small particles are allowed to just pass right through the membrane all on their own. They can come in and out freely. However, certain particles are going to need to, to be facilitated through the, uh, through the membrane by some type of channel. So channel-mediated facilitated diffusion is where we have some type of transmembrane protein that forms this little channel in the center that allows uh, this, this, this gray particle to come from the outside to the inside. 
And this could go the other way. We can have channel of proteins that allow certain things to go from the inside to the outside as well. Um, our carrier-mediated facilitated diffusion, you can see, is going to take our much larger particles. Um, oftentimes, the channels are going to be what are known as ion channels. Ions tend to be a little bit smaller um, in, uh, in, in comparison to other molecules. Um, so, so ions are going to be able to cross here through these, these channels. But our very large molecules are often, need to going, uh, are often going to need to be facilitated through the membrane by some some type of carrier protein that can that can individually grab them. I like to think of these as, as sort of the bouncer at a at a club or something like that. You know, the, the bouncer allows one person to come in at a time. And they're gonna they're gonna check you before you come in, make sure that you've got everything that you need and so forth uh, before you can come in. So so the the carrier uh, the carrier mediated facilitated diffusion is still all of these are gonna progress along their concentration gradient. All of these, you know, if the concentration gradient was to change and it became high down here and low up here, that gradient might change. Change. We might we might have a different gradient there, but these are all going to be passive diffusion, which means that what 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 facilitates this diffusion is what facilitates this transport is going to be the direction of a concentration gradient. So we can see in this picture, this is channel-mediated facilitated diffusion. Again, channel-mediated facilitated diffusion is just referring to some type of diffusion that is facilitated in some way by a channel. That's going to be that's going to be referring to using a channel. So you can see a, a channel right here. This K plus here is a potassium ion. So a potassium ion is able to, to, to come here up to this channel and it's going to be able to pass freely through the through the through the channel here. And so this is is creating this little space for our for our potassium to come through it. Let's say maybe we have maybe we have you know a hundred uh, 100 different potassiums here. Well, they're all going to be able to come this way and make their way out of our cell. And so they're going to be able to have their diffusion facilitated by, by this channel protein. Now, our channel proteins can be what are known as gated. They can have gates, which means that if this gate closes, potassium will not be able to, to, to go through its channel any longer until the gate reopens. So you can see that if the gate closes, potassium can't cross. Some are going to be gated and some are not, but I do want to mention that we can have certain channels that are gated. And especially when we get to chapter 12, we're going to talk about a lot of these different types of channels that can be gated by different things. But for now, I just want you to note that the channels can have gates, and if that gate is open, our, our substituent can pass through our cell's, uh, our cell's plasma membrane down its concentration gradient. Carrier-mediated facilitated diffusion, um, again, very similar concept to our, uh, to our uh, um, uh, channel-mediated, however, we're just going to use a carrier protein. So carrier proteins are going to be very unique in that they are going to undergo what is known as a conformational change, um, basically just referring to a change in their shape when they are taking things from one side of the cell to another. So you can see uh, in this in this first picture here, you can see that this is going to refer to glucose. This, this purple particle is going to be glucose. And the gradient is set up from high concentration to low concentration. So there's a high concentration on the outside of the cell and a low concentration here on the inside of the cell. You can actually see, we can count these, we can count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 glucose molecules on the outside of the cell, and there's only one glucose molecule on the inside of the cell. So, so the concentration gradient uh, for glucose has been set up in this direction. So this this uh, this channel protein here you can see is open at this end. This is going to be open. Uh, this is going to be open up here, um, and it's going to be closed at the bottom. So it's going to be open to the extracellular fluid, but it's going to be closed to the intracellular fluid. Now when glucose comes in here and binds to the very specific site that only glucose will be allowed to bind to on the glucose transporter, um, this is going to, to essentially cause a conformational change, which is just a change in the shape of our molecule. Conformation refers to the shape of our molecule. So when we undergo a conformational change, our molecule, or our transmembrane protein, is going to change its shape. And you can see that it's now going to be closed up here, and it's going to be open down here, and that's going to allow glucose to come here into the inside of the cell. So again, this is also going to be facilitated along a concentration gradient. Now one thing I'd like to mention here is our channels and our carrier proteins are going to be very, very, very specific, which means that if this is the glucose transporter, this will only transport glucose. Fructose, sucrose, and galactose are not going to be able to come in here um, and bind to the glucose transporter. In this picture, we saw that this is the potassium channel, the K plus is potassium. So the potassium channel 
only allows potassium through it. This sodium, if, if there's a sodium, if sodium showed up here and it wanted to cross the membrane, if we had a sodium and it wanted to cross the membrane, this would not be able to take place. We could not go in this direction. Sodium would need to find the sodium channel in order to cross, uh, in order to cross the membrane. So we, we have very specific channels for very specific molecules. So, so when we look at these, potassium and sodium will need to have their own channels, just like glucose will need to have its own carrier. So you can see the conformational change that, uh, that took place here. When, when glucose binds, that's going to change the shape here, and it's going to open our, our, it's going to open our cell up here and close it here. And so this is going to transport one, one molecule at a time. And so when this protein uh, releases its glucose, it's going to change its shape back over here, and then this process is going to continue until that gradient has been, uh, has been uh, equilibrated. So next here is the concept of osmosis. This is our third type of passive transport. So osmosis will take into the account of the concept of simple diffusion, but this uh, we're now employing a, another concept, which is what is known as a selectively permeable membrane. Now one of the things that I forgot to mention about uh, the cell membrane uh, back on this slide is that the plasma membrane is selectively permeable. Um, and I, I talked a little bit about this, but I, but I, never, stated, uh, I never stated this uh, specifically. So what a selectively permeable membrane refers to is a, any type of membrane that gets to decide what comes in and what comes out. Um, so the, the, the plasma membrane, again, has these different channels that allow certain things to come in and stops other things from coming in. And so this selectively permeable membrane is going to be an important concept that we're going to use in understanding osmosis. And, and this concept of osmosis is going to be applied to our plasma membrane as well. So what we can see here on this picture is we have a, we have a beaker here with some, some fluid uh, in here. You can see this fluid and some different uh, amounts of particles and such. Um, and we have this semi-permeable membrane. Uh, running, running right across, uh, running right down the center of our beaker. So what we can see here is that we've, we've taken this semi-permeable membrane, and what this semi-permeable membrane uh, has in it that makes it unique are very, very small holes. So let's, uh, let, I'm going to explain this, uh, this picture, and we'll hopefully be able to make some sense of this. So there's two things that we need to, to note here uh, in the beaker. We have these purple particles that we see right here. I probably should, should circle this in purple, actually. I think we'll go black. We'll just kind of highlight these. We have these purple particles here. Um, and so these purple particles, these are going to represent glucose. So the purple particles are going to represent glucose. While we also have this, this reddish, this reddish substance in here. This reddish substance is going to be just going to be made up of water. Now I know that we've only drawn the, the, the circles in here for the for the purple, uh, for the purple dots. But water is its own particle as well, and there are going to be very, very small water particles that, uh, that, we, can, that we, can, we can imagine are going to be in this area as well. So this will be our key up here. We have, we have the purple particles representing glucose, and the red particles that we can't actually see because they're so tiny are going to be representing, uh, representing water. But what we, can, what we can also note here is that each side uh, in this, in this, this is sort of a, sort of a strange... Uh, picture here. This sort of sort of looks a little odd, so, so we're going to move from this side of the picture to this side. So what we can see on this side here is that each side is going to have an equal amount of volume. Each side, we'll just say, we're just going to say each side is one liter. Each side is going to have one liter. So you can see that the, the, the level here of all this, uh, of this fluid is going to be the same. There's this, this semi-permeable membrane running in the center. Um, and really, all we can really note the difference here is that there's a few more glucose particles on this side of, of our page. But eventually, we're going to get to this odd-looking shape here where, you know, the water levels are now, uh, are now totally different. This, uh, I should actually more accurately call these solution levels. Um, so there's going to be, in the solution level is going to be totally different here. It looks like th this has, this has 0.5 liters. Uh, or, or something of the sort, maybe even less than that, but we'll just say 0.5 liters. And this is going to have 1.5 liters. So something, something clearly changed here. Something made this happen, and that is osmosis. That's what allows for this phenomenon to occur. So let's, uh, let's, let's understand osmosis. So one of the things that we can note here about this first picture is that there are more glucose particles over here than there are over here. So that's going to be telling us that our glucose, or the concentration gradient for our glucose, is going to be pointing from the right side of the beaker to the left side of the beaker. There is a greater concentration of glucose particles over here than there are over here. So, so this, 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 these glucose particles are going to want to flow down their concentration gradient towards this side of the beaker. 
So that's the, that's the first thing that we, we want to mention here. But, and, and, and if we didn't have this semi-permeable membrane, this would not, this would be able to happen. Our glucose particles would move this way. But we have this semi-permeable membrane. Now, I haven't told you yet, this semi-permeable membrane is going to have very, very small pores within it. The pores are so small that they will not allow glucose particles to cross. So glucose can, in fact, not cross. Glucose particles cannot move from one side to the other because we have this semi-permeable membrane. So, so this concentration gradient is still pointing in this direction. We, our glucose particles want to move across the membrane, but the holes and the pores inside of the membrane are not large enough for our glucose molecules to move. Now there's one other element about, uh, about this picture um, that I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to, to talk about here, and that is the water. So the water is all this, uh, this reddish stuff in here. Now, because these are equal volumes, it's important to, to, to note that these are equal volumes. Because these are the same amount of fluid on either side, and there's more glucose particles on this side, there's going to be less water mo molecules on this side in comparison to this side. So the way we look at that is that glucose, out of all the space, since there's more glucose particles, Glucose is taking up more of the space on this side of the beaker than it is on this side of the beaker. So what that means is if there's more glucose particles over here and less water over here, that means that there's more water molecules over here. And if there's more water molecules over here, we can say that we have a higher concentration of water on this side, and we have a lower concentration of water on this side. That's going to set up another concentration gradient for water in this direction. So water's concentration gradient is going to be pointing from the left side of the beaker to the right side. And again, this is because there are more glucose particles on the right side taking up more of that available one liter. So this selectively permeable membrane is selectively permeable for water. This membrane is going to be allowed, it's going to allow water to cross through it, but it's going to stop glucose because it's going to have pores that only water can fit through. And so since water's concentration gradient is pointing in this direction and glucose's concentration is pointing in this direction, we have, uh, we have sort of a, an interesting situation here. While glucose wants to move this way and water wants to move this way, water is the only one that's actually allowed to move. So the, the, the burden of equilibrating this solution falls on water to make sure that the concentrations of either side here are going to be the same. So essentially, because the glucose can't move from the right side to the left side, water molecules are going to be the only thing that moves from the left side to the right side. And that's where we get this oddly shaped, uh, this oddly shaped beaker with, with some amount over here and some amount over here and, uh, and so forth. Um, and it's because the water from the left side is moving down its concentration gradient. So what we'll say is that the solvent is going to be what's actually moving here. Remember those two terms, the solvent and the solute. Glucose here is the solute, while water is the solvent. The solute cannot move here, and therefore the solvent will move in its place. So at the chemical level, there are, are water molecules that are going to be moving you know, here and there. They're going to be moving in either direction. There's a lot of movement at the chemical level. But we say that the net movement is, in, uh, is, is essentially moving from the left side of the beaker towards the right side of the beaker. The net movement refers to the overall movement of all the water molecules in this beaker. So more water molecules have moved from the left side of the beaker to the right side of the beaker. And again, water has moved along its concentration gradient, and therefore this is still considered passive transport. So it's important that you guys understand uh, the concept of osmosis, because that's going to leave us in, uh, lead us into our next concept of tonicity. And so tonicity refers to how concentrated specific uh, solutions are and how those different concentrations are going to affect the shape of particular cells. So we have three, uh, three different solutions when, we, uh, when we're mentioning tonicity. We have an isotonic solution, we have a hypotonic solution, and we have a hypertonic solution. Each of these solutions will differently refer to the solution that the cell is in. So you can see that we've taken a, a red blood cell and we've submerged it here into a, into a glass of, uh, of some, some fluid here. So this is going to be water and it's going to have a particular tonicity.
And so the isotonic solution is going to have uh, essentially the same amount of concentration in the solution as the cell has. So our isotonic solutions will have the same concentration um, from both the inside and the outside of the cell. Now, remember what I mentioned um, a few slides ago is how there is a net movement of water. Water is always going to be moving. Water is always going to be moving into the cell and out of the cell. But because the concentrations here of our, uh, of our cells um, and of the solution out here are roughly the same, there's going to be no change in our red blood cell shape. So we still keep the same shape of our red blood cell. So again, when we look at the isotonic solution, just to, just to explain this one more time, you know, we might have a, uh, we might say we, we have essentially the same concentration of salt on the outside of the cell in the solution um, as we have on the inside of the cell. Um, and we, we have only just drawn, uh, I've only just drawn a different amount of particles from the outside to the center, um, uh, or the outside to the inside of the cell, because the cell has a, a lower volume. So the concentration um, is, is by volume. So concentration is measured in, uh, in what is known as moles, and um, we will say that moles per liter. Um, and moles is just a really big number to, to refer to an amount of particles. Um, so we have, we have a, a lot of particles out here, um, you know, to, to a larger volume comparatively um, here to, uh, to the inside of the cell where we have a smaller amount of particles but to a smaller volume. So, so, so the concentration does end up being the same between the inside and the outside of the cell. But the, 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 the purpose of the isotonic solution is to understand that the net movement of water, how much water is moving outside of the cell is going to be moving uh, the same amount inside of the cell. So because the net movement of water from the inside to the outside of the cell is the same, we can actually also say that there is no net movement of water and that's what gives us our normal red blood cell shape. Now in a hypotonic solution, this is where things start to change. So again, a hypotonic solution refers to the solution uh, by which our red blood cell is, uh, is submersed within. So in a hypotonic solution, the, the solution itself is going to have a lower concentration of solute than the cell has. So the cell is going to have a more highly concentrated fluid on the inside compared to the fluid that is surrounding that cell. And therefore, because we have more, if we take into account the concept of osmosis, these solute particles can't move in and out of the cell. So the water is going to be what moves, or the solution, or the solvent, is going to move into the cell to try to equilibrate that concentration, which is what we saw occurring with osmosis. So this is demonstrating the concept of osmosis here. And because more water moves towards the inside of the cell than out of the cell, that gives us this, uh, this sort of, sort of uh, um, exploded uh, red blood cell. And our red, cell, uh, red blood cell is actually going to undergo what is known as hemolysis. It's going to pop because so much water is going to flow into the, into the red blood cell, it's going to pop, and that's going to be hemolysis. Remember this, this suffix here, lysis, is going to be referring to the breaking of something. So hemolysis, heme for blood, um, that's going to be the breaking of our red blood cell. So you can see this hypotonic solution shows our red blood cell um, very, very, uh, very, very filled with solvent. In the hypertonic solution, this is where our solution is going to have a higher concentration than the inside of our cells. So the hypertonic solution, again, we're referring to the solution. The solution has more concentration than does the inside of the cell. So there's a higher solute concentration on the outside of the cell compared to the solute concentration on the inside of the cell. Again, taking into the concept of osmosis, if we have more solute particles over here, even though there's, there's a less in here, there's actually a higher water concentration compared to the, compared to the volume down here than uh, is considered in the solution. So there's actually going to be a net movement of water out of our uh, out of our red blood cell and therefore that's going to cause our red blood cell to crenate or to shrivel to shrivel or crenate crenation is what uh, what our red blood cells are undergoing here so you can see this this crenation right here so these are our three different types of, 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 of solutions, these, these three different um, concepts when we talk about tonicity. And they are all applying osmosis to our red blood cells structure. That is going to take us into active transport. Now before I jump into active transport, I'm just going to remind you all that active transport is going to require energy in the form of ATP. So, so that is active transport, and we're going to, uh, to talk about a few, uh, few types of active transport. But before I get into this, I'm going to mention a few, uh, a few statements here. So potassium, potassium ion concentration is high inside of the cell. 
This is a this is just a fact about our cells. Potassium is supposed to be um, supposed to have a high concentration inside the cell and a low concentration outside the cell, while sodium is going to have a high concentration on the outside of the cell and a low concentration on the inside of the cell. So potassium is high on the inside, sodium is high on the outside. And that's important for us to, uh, to, to note, that that sets up these gradients. If we have potassium high on the inside of our cell, you can see that this is the cytosol, our, our inner cellular components, and this is our extracellular fluid. If potassium is high on the inside, that's going to set a gradient up, moving from the inside of the cell towards the outside of the cell. Sodium, on the other hand, is going to be uh, is going to have a higher concentration on the outside of the cell, and therefore its gradient is going to be pointing towards the inside of our cell. So active transport refers to, to, to using ATP to pump against our concentration gradients. So um, normal cells exist with a higher concentration on the inside of potassium and a higher concentration of sodium on the outside. That's how normal cells exist, and I will talk in later chapters about why this is. But for now, take my word for it, that these gradients need to be maintained in order for cellular function to progress properly. So because we need to maintain these gradients, we need to push any potassium leakage that might come in or might come out of the cell and any sodium leakage that might come into the cell back to their respective parts. So that is where we get into the first concept of active transport or what is known as primary transport. So the example we're going to be using for primary transport is the, what is known as the sodium potassium pump or the sodium potassium ATPase. So again, we're going against our concentration gradients. So sodium's gradient, you can see here, is pointing from the outside of the cell towards the inside because we want to have more sodium on the outside of the cell. But again, there is going to be some leakage of, of these different, uh, of these different uh, molecules. And there's going to be times where, where sodium is going to be allowed into the cell and we're going to need to be able to put it back uh, where, it was, uh, where it belongs on the outside of the cell. So you can see that this is the sodium-potassium pump. This is a carrier protein that's going to be um, taking in three sodium ions. It's important that we note the, note the numbers of these. Three sodium ions are going to enter the sodium-potassium pump. And since this is a carrier protein, this is going to use ATP to change the shape and allow, allow for our carrier protein to expel those sodium, uh, those sodium ions outside of the cell. So we've actually just pushed these sodium, uh, these sodium ions here, as we go up this way, out of our cell. We've pushed them against their concentration gradient. You can see sodium's gradient is pointing towards the inside. So we're pushing these sodium, these sodium ions against their concentration gradient. And that is thanks to the use of ATP. ATP is what gives us energy. Um, again, we're going to talk more about ATP, but ATP, um, again, is adenosine triphosphate. And when we break off that, uh, that, that last phosphate on ATP, we're going to release a lot of energy. And in return, we're going to get ADP and a phosphate. So ADP stands for adenosine diphosphate because there's now two phosphates. So with the energy derived from ATP, we're able to change the, the conformation of this carrier protein, and that's going to allow sodium to move against its concentration gradient. Now the sodium potassium pump is special um, because it actually is going to function to actually move two different things. This is going to move sodium and potassium. So potassium is going to be able to come in here and bind after, after our, our carrier protein has now been opened to the outside. So once sodium leaves, potassium can come in here Two potassium, uh, potassium ions can come in here. And then there, once they, once they click in place, this is going to change the shape back to our initial sodium uh, potassium pump. And you can see that the phosphate is going to be removed. So, so again, as, as we look at these, we're pumping each of these things against their concentration gradient. And we're going to talk a lot more about this particular pump in later chapters. But for right now, we want to understand the concept of active transport, which is using ATP to pump certain things against their concentration gradient. So we've taken we've taken sodium from 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 where it's uh, from its this will be its area of low concentration and we've taken it and pumped it back to its area of high concentration and we've done the exact same thing with potassium. So this is going to demonstrate active or or primary transport. Oftentimes primary transport does is just called active transport. But it's more accurate to call it primary transport because there's some other types of active transport as well and those are shown here. So we have endocytosis 
And we have exocytosis. We have phagocytosis and pinocytosis. All of these are different types of active transport under the realm of vesicular transport. So primary transport uses ATP uh, in, in, in something uh, to, you know, to, to pump things against their concentration gradient. Um, active transport, in, including vesicular transport, uses a cellular organelle known as vesicles, which is just a bubble that is found within our cell. So endocytosis refers to taking something into the cell, and exocytosis refers to take, or essentially releasing something from our cell. So we're, we're ex exuding something from our cell. So when we bring something in, it's endocytosis. When we bring something out, that's going to be exocytosis. Now there are two types of endocytosis. Endocytosis can, can, can refer to the taking in of large particles, and that is known as phagocytosis. And epinocytosis refers to taking a liquid into the cell. So we're taking, in, depending on what we're taking into our cell, we're going to have a different name for each of these. Phagocytosis, again, is this, 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 um, this prefix here. Phago means eating. So this is cell eating. We are taking in something larger into the cell. And this is what our immune cells do to other potentially dangerous bacteria. Our immune cells will, will phagocytize immune cells, and it will eat them, and it will break them up. And so a larger particles can, can enter the cell. Um, but pinocytosis is also called bulk phase transport because this is just where our cell sort of forms a, a random vesicle around the, outside of our, uh, around the outside of our cell and brings in whatever is there, just as if the, if the cell is drinking the fluid around it. And then, of course, exocytosis, again, is just referring to releasing anything from our cell. So there's one other type of endocytosis, and that is what is known as receptor-mediated endocytosis. So remember receptors when we talked about our, our different proteins, uh, our different membrane proteins. So receptors are very, very specific. So this is endocytosis that is mediated by receptors. That's how we'll look at this. And we're going to use the LDL receptor as an example here. So LDL is just a, is just a type of uh, cholesterol here, and we're going to be bringing this here uh, into, into the cell. So what, what happens first here is that our, our ligand is going to bind to the receptor. Remember, a ligand is just anything that binds to a receptor. And since we have the LDL receptor, the ligand is LDL. So LDL is going to come and bind to the receptor. And when we have enough of these, there's a particular protein found on the inside of our, of our cell membrane known as clathrin. And these clathrin proteins are going to flex. You can see that they're going to, to be bending inwards here. You can see all these receptors are coming, sort of looks like that they're falling into the cell. And if we go over, over time, we can see that we're actually, these, these clathrin proteins are going to be flexing um, a lot more. And so you can see, you can see here that, uh, that we're forming this, uh, this, uh, this, this bud here. So this is budding off here uh, to take these receptors into the cell. And once the clathrin proteins have, have sort of flexed enough, we can actually form a little bubble known as a vesicle. So clathrin, again, is going to, to eventually be, you know, um, released from the vesicle and recycled. Our bodies are very efficient and they'll recycle um, these, uh, these clathrin proteins. But that's going to leave us with, uh, with an uncoated vesicle. So the steps here, we can see the binding of LDL to the receptor, and then we're going to have vesicle formation, which is where we have this budding inwards of our, of our plasma cell membrane. So the plasma membrane is actually, that's all vesicle is. It's just a, it's just a segment of the plasma membrane that has sort of bubbled itself in, and it makes this, uh, it makes this uh, little, little structure here, this structure known as a vesicle. You can see that there are, these receptors are found here on the inside of our, uh, of our vesicle. The third step is uncoating, where we release these uh, we release these clathrin proteins back up to the cell membrane. But then we're going to have the fusion with an endosome, and an endosome is just sort of like a like another vesicle. It's just sort of hanging out within the cell. It sort of sets up another environment. So it's just an an, an additional uh, it's sort of uh, an additional space found within our cell. And so so um, our, our uncoated vesicle will fuse with an endosome. It's going to come in here and it's going to, to, to bud inwards and it's going to, to release all of its contents into the endosome, which is where we can then recycle our receptors. That's going to be step five here. We're going to, to recycle the receptors and we're going to reuse those receptors uh, as well up at the, at the plasma membrane. And then we're going to, after budding uh, another, another vesicle here off of the endosome, we're going to be left with a transport vesicle only containing the initial particles that we wanted at first, only containing those LDL particles. And this is where we're going to have a lysosome come in. This lysosome is going to come in and fuse. These are going to fuse together and make, make one large, uh, large structure. And lysosomes are going to have digestive enzymes that break down these particles, and then we can do something with, uh, with those parts. 
So the plasma membrane of our cell is going to sort of sort of fold inwards, and it's going to fold its way, and it's going to make a, a little a, a little a little bubble here into the cell, and eventually this is going to pinch off, and that's what forms that's what forms our vesicle. And so every time we have a fusion is where our, our, our vesicle is going, to, uh, is going to be on the inside of our cell and it's going to approach, uh, approach the cell membrane and it's going to fuse. It's going to fuse with the, with the cell membrane. So we're just gonna we're just gonna say our vesicle is blue and the cell membrane is uh, is red. And so what's eventually going to happen here is that what was our vesicle is going to have fused with our with our cell membrane, and then we're going to have um, you know it's going to become part of our cell membrane as well. So we're gonna have I'm gonna have a structure that sort of looks like this. And this is much easier on the on the on the whiteboards uh, at the at the at the campus, but uh, but I'm doing my best here. Um, so so you can see that the vesicles will then fuse with the membrane, and that will exude the content. We're going to have different contents inside of our vesicles, and then this when, when we have the fusion of our vesicle to the plasma membrane, this is going to allow these contents to uh, to be released out of the cell. Um, so so this is the uh, this is the overall view of of receptor mediated endocytosis. Now it's important to note receptor mediated endocy uh, endocytosis is very very specific. It is one of the most specific types of transport that we're going to have because we have receptors. Receptors are very 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 specific. Receptors can be so specific that they will only bind to a specific particle. So again, LDL is going to be the only thing that can bind to uh, to, to to the LDL receptor. Um, there might be some other very similarly shaped molecules, but receptors are very specific, um, and they give uh, essentially what they're going to do is they're going to be taking up these specific ligands. So receptor mediated endocytosis is going to to uh, include lysosomes, and I will be I will be mentioning a lot more about the lysosome uh, when we get into the cellular organelle portion of this uh, of this presentation. But lysosomes are going to be what contain digestive enzymes, and they're going to be breaking down uh, things within our cell. So so hopefully this uh, this is uh, clicking with you for how uh, receptor mediated endocytosis is going to work. So next up is phagocytosis. Phagocytosis is going to be very, very similar to receptor-mediated endocytosis, but we're just going to take up something larger. So you can see that we're taking in a microbe here. So this microbe, you know, perhaps with its glycocalyx, is going to attach to some of these receptors, and then our cell is going to release what are known as pseudopods. So pseudopods are important. I would definitely want you to know pseudopods. Be, be, be comfortable with these. These are extensions that our cell is going to reach out and attach to these uh, is essentially sort of wrap around this microbe. You can see the pseudopods here. This is our, this is our white blood cell. This is a yeast cell, and our and our our white blood cell is going to be phagocytizing this yeast cell. So these here that we can see around the sides, these are the pseudopods. These are going to be reaching around our microbe to create what is known as a phagosome. So a phagosome is, is just similar to a vesicle, but it contains the contents of whatever was phagocytized. And the lysosome is going to be another important characteristic here. The lysosome contains these digestive enzymes, which we're going to use to break down this, this, this phagosome here. So you can see the fusion of our lysosome is going to come in here and bind to the, to the, to the phagosome. They're going to become one large, one large uh, you know, phagolysosome. And the digestive enzymes are going to break down this microbe into what's known as a residual body, which is just what's left over after the lysosome has done its work. So this is how we defend against other cells. Whenever you get some bacterial infection, um, our, our cells are going to be fighting off these bacteria by phagocytizing, uh, by phagocytizing those bacterial cells. So two, two types of phagocytes. These are, these are cells that will phagocytize, are macrophages and neutrophils. Those are two different types of white blood cells. So this, this could be either a macrophage or a, or a white blood cell. But again, phagocytosis refers to the eating of a larger particle. So when with phagocytosis, we're bringing something larger into the cell. And this is going to be different from our, from our penocytosis, which refers to our cells drinking. It is also known as bulk phase transport. So bulk phase transports, um, of, this is called bulk phase transport because the cell just sort of randomly forms a vesicle here to take in whatever might be uh, around the outside of our cell. So you can see that, you know, we're just, we're just sort of randomly forming it and we're just taking in whatever's there. Um, so, you know, there could, be, there could be green particles or blue particles, glucose, water, then whatever's there right outside the cell, the cell's going to just randomly form this vesicle around the contents outside. That's going to, again, give us a, a, a vesicle, and our lysosome is going to digest those contents as well.
So the only difference between pinocytosis and phagocytosis is that phagocytosis includes um, phagosomes and, and eating a larger particle such as another bacterial cell, while pinocytosis is bulk phase because it just takes the bulk of what is around, uh, around the cell. Exocytosis, as I mentioned uh, earlier, um, is just essentially when different secretory vesicles are going to fuse with our plasma membrane and release all of those contents out to the cell. Um, uh, so, 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 um, so that's what exocytosis refers to, is just something being released from our cell. Transcytosis is a combination of, of our exocytosis and endocytosis. So, so what happens with transcytosis is certain things will be endocytosed, they'll move across the cell, and then they'll be exocytosed. So transcytosis is just a combination of endocytosis and exocytosis together. So that will conclude uh, quite a bit of information on the plasma membrane. Make sure you're comfortable with the plasma membrane um, before you move on to this next part here. But the next part of our uh, presentation is going to be referring to the cytoplasm. And we're going to talk about the different uh, organelles that make up the cytoplasm and, and the different constituents uh, that make up our cytoplasm. So the cytoplasm is made up of cytosol and organelles. So, so think back to, to one of our first slides that we did in this, uh, in this video. The cytoplasm is everything between the plasma membrane and the nucleus. All of this stuff in here, with the exception of the nucleus, is going to be the cytoplasm. So anything inside the cell but the nucleus is our cytoplasm. So cytosol is the fluid that, we, that can be found inside of our cell. This, uh, this sort of, sort of uh, yellowy-orange stuff in here that's suspending all of our different organelles is what is known as cytosol. So the cytosol is going to be suspending these, uh, these, these different organs in here, or these organelles, as I should say, because all of these structures, as, as the human body has organs, our cells are going to have organelles. And the organelles are, are just like the organs of our cells. So they are very specialized, and each cell is going to have different organelles. But depending on the organelles that a cell has, that's going to, to, to make our cells look different. It's going to make our cells act different and perform different functions. So cytoplasm and organelles are going to be the major, the major two things that make up cytoplasm. So we're going to go over some very specific cellular organelles. Some of, some of these are going to be unique to, to all cells. Some of these are going to be unique to some cells. Um, so, so we're going to go over uh, some of these, uh, these organelles now. So first and foremost is our cell's cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton is made up of three different types of protein filaments, and those are microfilaments, intermediate filaments, and microtubules. Just as the skeleton of our body is going to give our body some type of shape, um, the cytoskeleton is going to help maintain the shape of our cell. The cytoskeleton, being, being made out of proteins, are also going to, to be very helpful in producing cell movements. So, so the, the cytoskeleton is going to be supporting those pseudopods. Whenever they, whenever they progress outwards, the cytoskeleton is going to be, going to be giving those shape. So, so again, I want you to know these three types of, uh, these three types of cytoskeletal uh, filaments here, these three protein filaments that make up the cytoskeleton. These are two structures that very closely relate to the, uh, to the cytoskeleton, but they are considered their, their own organelles also. So cilia and flagella. So these are different projections that come out of our cells. These, these hair-like projections, you can see the cilia here. These are hair-like projections. And the sperm cell is going to have this tail known as a flagellum. Um, so, so the cilia and flagella are also going to have different functions based on, on the fact that they all have a different structure. So cilia's main function is to beat. Cilia are going to, to, to be pushing. They're going to push. They're going to rock the fluid around the outside of the cell and push it in, in a particular direction. The flagella is, is, is also a cell, circuit, uh, a cell projection, but it actually functions to move the cell. Um, so one of the organelles we're going to learn about shortly is the mitochondria. The flagellum is going to have a lot of mitochondria, and that's going to produce a lot of energy. And so the flagella is going to flap back and forth. Uh, just This tail is going to flap back and forth, and that's going to propel the sperm cell forward. Um, so these two, uh, these two surface projections are going to have different functions, um, but they, they are going to be sort of extensions of our cytoskeleton. Ribosomes are going to be another organelle, and we're going to learn about these at the end of this presentation in detail. So the function of ribosomes is protein synthesis. 
these will create protein synthesis is the creation of something so protein synthesis uh, is going to be facilitated by ribosomes now there are two subunits uh, in our ribosomes we're not going to go much deeper than that into the ribosomes but I do want you to know that there is a large subunit and a small subunit and each of these are going to make up the ribosome so this is a ribosome here and these are different parts these are the subunits of our ribosomes so these ribosomes can, can be floating around in the cytosol freely, or they can be attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. The, the rough endoplasmic reticulum um, is going to, to, to have all these little ribosomes stuck on it, and that's actually what gives it its name. These, 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 the ribosome gets its name. I'm sorry, the endoplasmic reticulum gets its name, um, uh, but this is the rough endoplasmic reticulum, by having these ribosomes found here on the outside. Ribosomes can also be found uh, closely associated with the nuclear membrane as well. So the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, there are two types of endoplasmic reticulum. There is a rough endoplasmic reticulum and there is a smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And again, the only difference here is that the rough endoplasmic reticulum is going to have ribosomes. And that gives the rough ER um, a, lot of different, uh, a lot of different abilities. So the endoplasmic reticulum makes up this uh, this network of uh, this network of, uh, of of sacs that are attached here to the nuclear membrane. Now the nucle the nucleus is going to have a double membrane known as the nuclear envelope. So the endoplasmic reticulum attaches to this nuclear envelope, which we can see right here. So specifically, it's going to be the rough ER that attaches to the nuclear envelope, while the smooth ER is going to be somewhat attached to the, to the rough ER. So each of these is going to have a different function based on, based on its characteristics. So the rough ER is going to synthesize glycoproteins because it has ribosomes and those are going to help for protein synthesis. But this is also going to synthesize phospholipids. And those are then going to be transported throughout the cell. They're going to be given to certain organelles. Certain organelles, like the nucleus here, is going to need its, its own phospholipids for its own membrane. Vesicles are going to be made up of phospholipids as well. They're made up of the same stuff that the plasma membrane is made out of. So we have to have um, our rough ER creating these phospholipids and glycoproteins for all of the different um, uh, other organelles in our cell. You can see that phospholipids are also going to be coming here um, uh, from the, to the plasma membrane. Our rough ER is going to be making the phospholipids for our plasma membrane. Um, and so they could also be uh, excreted as well. So, so the rough ER is going to be making these, these glycoproteins and phospholipids, and those are going to be transported throughout the cell to make up other organelles. The smooth ER is going to be making fatty acids as well as steroids. So these are going to be a little different, but fatty acids are also going to be very important. Um, as we, as uh, fatty acids are going to be a major component of our phospholipids. We need to be able to have these fatty acids. Now, most importantly here about the smooth ER is the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is going to inactivate and detoxify poisons and drugs that enter the body. So the liver is going to be an organ that's going to, to detoxify drugs from our bodies. So liver cells, also known as hepatocytes, will have a much higher concentration of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum than other types of cells. Um, our muscle cells is one, uh, is one example of cells that's going to have a very specialized smooth endoplasmic plasmic reticulum and it's going to store calcium that's only in uh, only in our muscle cells but the smooth ER uh, in, in, in all of our cells is going to inactivate and detoxify drugs um, so, so so I want you to know the functions of each of these organelles I want you to know where they're found and in the characteristics of each one so you can see this network of, of membranous sacs here that are sort of sort of uh, you know all connecting and such this is going to be our rough ER with the ribosomes on it and the smooth ER is going to have no ribosomes on it the Golgi complex is going to be another uh, another organelle that we see, and the Golgi complex functions as uh, sort of like the the UPS store of uh, of the cell. It's going to be accepting proteins from the rough ER. So so when when the rough ER, you can see the rough ER over here. These ribosomes on the rough ER are going to create these proteins, and the proteins are then going to be transported to the Golgi through uh, through different vesicles. And so the Golgi complex is going to be accepting these proteins. Um, it's going to be modifying these proteins. It's going to take these proteins and it's going to add some carbohydrates and make them glycoproteins. Um, it's going to modify um, and create glycolipids. It's going to create lipoproteins. So, so this is where we're going to sort of modify a lot of the things that come from the rough endoplasmic reticulum.
It is then going to decide where these, these different uh, ma macromolecules are going to go, and it's going to send them on their way. So they might get sent here, um, you know, back into the to their very own cell. They might send uh, vesicles out to the cell. They might send uh, vesicles up to the plasma membrane to, to, to send them over here, or they might send them actually to other cells. So, so um, proteins can actually be exported from the cell into, into different places. And so the Golgi complex, like I said, serves as like the UPS store. It's going to be packaging up and, uh, and making sure that everything's ready to go before these proteins um, are ready to, uh, to do their job. The most important thing that I'm going to mention about lysosomes is that lysosomes contain digestive enzymes. And we saw lysosomes containing digestive enzymes in many different types of active transport that I was, uh, I was mentioning just a minute ago. So the Golgi complex is actually going to be forming the lysosome as well. The lysosomes are going to be coming from the Golgi complex, and the, the digestive enzymes are going to be found in the, in, the center of the, in the center of the lysosome. Again, all a lysosome is is just an, a big bubble within the cell that contains these digestive enzymes. And our cells use these lysosomes to break down foreign components that make their way into our cell, um, or perhaps to, 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 to digest organelles that have broken down in our cells and that are causing problems. So, so um, these will be fusing with, so with different types of phagosomes or endosomes, and they're going to be releasing those digestive enzymes into, uh, you know, in, in to, to, to contact um, the contents of these different vesicles. This is also going to digest worn out organelles. This is known as autophagy. So remember, phagy refers to eating. So auto refers to self. So this is self-eating. We're eating up our own organelles. So, so, so lysosomes can be used to destroy foreign invaders as well as, as our own organelles that have broken down. They can be used to, to destroy uh, entire cells um, or different parts of, uh, of, of cells as well. So this is autolysis. Remember, here's lysis again. This, this, suffix keeps, uh, this suffix keeps coming back, so make sure you're comfortable with this. Autolysis is, is breaking our own entire cells. So we can actually um, uh, phagocytize our own cells if a cell you know, has become cancerous or, or something like that. So, so lysosomes will contain digestive enzymes. That's going to be the major takeaway from our lysosomes, and they're going to be breaking down, um, they're going to be breaking down different kinds. Contents. So lysis here is going to be sounding very similar to lysosome. So remember, this 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 is a very important suffix. Make sure you are comfortable with that suffix, um, as it is uh, it has appeared uh, several times. So the lysosomes is going to break uh, break down other. Uh, the peroxisomes that we find within our cells are similar to the lysosomes. However, they're going to work in a different way. Lysosomes contain digestive enzymes. However, peroxisomes are going to be using oxygen to break down organic substances. So they are similar to our lysosomes, but they're going to be to be a little bit, little bit different. You can see the peroxisome shown over here. So one example of an enzyme found within a peroxisome is what is known as catalase. Catalase is going to be breaking down hydrogen peroxide. H2O2 is the chemical formula for hydrogen peroxide. And this, this can cause a lot of problems if it's allowed to, uh, to be in the body. And so um, what happens is if we, uh, if we were to uh, you know, use oxygen to break, uh, what's, what's going to happen here is essentially this H2O2 is going to split into two OHs. And those are going to cause a cascade of problems that occur within the body. So catalase is going to be breaking these, uh, these substances down by adding in an oxygen. If we add in an oxygen to this, we're going to get an O2 and an H2O, which is just more oxygen and water. So peroxisomes are going to use oxygen to break down substances instead of digestive enzymes. Proteasomes are going, you can see them uh, listed over here, proteasomes are going to be sort of sort of cylindrical in their shape, but proteasomes are going to be uh, certain structures in the cell that break down proteins. So these are going to be destroying unneeded proteins. These are going to be de uh, destroying damaged proteins or faulty proteins that have been misfolded. So misfolded proteins are going to be um, potentially causing a lot of problems. If we have a protein that doesn't fold right, it can really cause a lot of damage to our cell. It's important that our, you know, the, the, the contents of our cells are going to be properly functioning when we are using them. So proteasomes are going to be taking these large proteins that are, you know, maybe we have excessive proteins, maybe we have proteins that have been, been damaged and are just sitting around as waste products, or we have proteins that are misfolded and that are wreaking havoc within our cell. Proteasomes are going to find those, and they're going to be chopping them up into smaller, uh, smaller peptide chains. And so, so our proteasomes help to protect our cell uh, in, a, in another unique way also.
the mitochondria is going to be the next uh, cellular organelle we're going to mention. Now, I'm sure uh, you have all heard the, uh, the, the famous phrase, the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, and this is in fact true. The mitochondria is going to be what produces energy inside our cell so that we can have energy to carry out our cellular needs. So the structure of our mitochondria, of course, is directly related to its function. The mitochondria is going to have a double membrane. It's going to have an external membrane, and it's going to have an internal membrane. And the internal membrane is going to be highly folded. And this is it was with the goal of increasing surface area. We are wanting to be able to fit more of the plasma membrane uh, in this inner mitochondrial in this inner mitochondrial membrane. And the folds here that we see on the inner mitochondrial membrane are what are known as cristae. Cristae are the folds of our inner mitochondrial membrane. And then on the inside of our inner mitochondrial membrane, we have what's known as the mitochondrial matrix. And so this is going to be uh, one of the, this is going to be, we'll, we'll say for, uh, uh, for, for chapter 25, which will be the next video we, uh, we do after this one. Um, chapter 25, the mitochondria is going to be, uh, is going to be the most important uh, organelle uh, for us there. So the mitochondria is going to be the organelle that we have that produces ATP. So we can also say that this is the site of aerobic cellular respiration. Um, cellular respiration is the process by which we can take glucose and turn it into ATP. And so, the, so the, our, our, bodies, our body's energy sources are coming from these mitochondria. So what's also interesting about the mitochondria is that it has its own mitochondrial DNA. DNA uh, usually exists in the nucleus, but our mitochondria is going to have um, a small segment of DNA as well. And the, and the mitochondrial DNA will always come from the mother's side. So sorry, fellas, you guys won't be able to pass down your mitochondrial DNA, um, but this is going to be one one uh, unique structure to our mitochondria. And it was actually thought, and it was actually thought uh, within this theory um, uh, that, that, that the mitochondria got this DNA um, as as starting off as as another cell that sort of migrated and started to live inside of another cell. So the mitochondria at first was, is thought to have been this other cell that was existing inside of a of, of, of you know a host cell, uh, and they ended up working really well together. And so they just kind of kept on they just kept on doing their thing and uh, and now we have we have mitochondria so that's that's one theory about how the uh, how the mitochondria came to be um, but uh, but I'll I'll leave uh, I'll leave the uh, the different uh, theories for how all of this stuff uh, originated uh, for your uh, for your free time we just want to learn about what the mitochondria is going to do and its different characteristics so lastly here for our organelles is going to be the nucleus. As I mentioned, the nucleus is going to have its own double membrane known as the nuclear envelope. And there's going to be certain, uh, certain uh, polyribosomes that are going to be found here on our, our, our nuclear envelope. The nucleus is going to contain a, a dense part known as the nucleolus, and this is going to be functioning to create ribosomes. The nucleolus makes ribosomes, and so ribosomes are then going to go in turn make up uh, make proteins. So the nucleus houses all of the genetic material that we will see in our cells. The nuclear envelope is going to have a series of pores uh, found on it, which will allow different uh, different structures to come in and out of the nucleus. So nuclear pores will, will control the movement of substances in and out of our nucleus, and we're also going to have our, our, our genetic material, or our DNA that is found, our nucleic acid found inside of our nucleus. And as we talked about in chapter 2, um, nucleic acid, or DNA, is going to contain a genetic code for each individual person that's going to be unique, uh, with the exception of, uh, of, of, of twins. So the nucleus is sort of the control center of our cell. All of the cell's functions, the which organelles our cells are going to have, that's all going to come from our nucleus. So the nucleus um, is, 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 our, is sort of the brain of our cells. This is where all of the, uh, the other um, cellular parts can, uh, can, can sort of originate from here within our cell. So when we go a little deeper into, uh, into DNA, we're going to, uh, to understand that there are a few different uh, forms of DNA that, that, that DNA can be existing in. We have chromatin, we have chromosomes, and we have chromatids. Now chromatin is going to be uh, a, a form of DNA which is just sort of a big jumbled mass. It's just a big mass of DNA. I like to envision chromatin as just sort of being this, this big ball of spaghetti. It's just sort of randomly sort of arranged. And that's going to be chromatin. Chromatin. Chromatin with an N. And we also have chromatids and we have chromosomes. So I, so I want to just mention that chromatids are referring to replicated chromosomes. And each chromosome is going to refer to, to a different segment of DNA. Each, each human cell is going to contain... Um, 
46 chromosomes with the exception of gametes. The sex cells will have half that amount, which is 23. So the nucleus contains this, this, this genetic material, contains um, this, this DNA. And along our genetic material, or our DNA, are going to have genes that are going to regulate our body's functions. Everything in our body is going to be regulated by these genes. The way that you look, the foods that make you sick, everything about you is going to be contained within your genetic code. So genetics is a very, uh, it's a very, uh, a very booming field right now. There's a lot of research uh, into genetics uh, right now uh, that's uh, that, that's taking place because there's so much that can be, uh, there's so much that can be researched uh, uh, with uh, with DNA. There's so much to still learn about DNA, which is one of the reasons it fascinates me as well.